Welcome to the Global Market Outlook April 2022. Uh, we're going to review uh, the latest news. We're going to have a look at um, market moving events that are coming up. Uh, we're going to see what happened in March and if things have settled down a little bit. And, uh, and then we're going to review uh, our global equity portfolio. Uh, we've also been picking up positions, so we'll have a look at some of the stock picks. Uh, as you, usual, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, hit me up in the chat window uh, or the Q&A box. Uh, I will probably only answer them at the end. Um, if there is something particularly interesting and it's uh, about a topic, I will try and cover it as well. Uh, but I will stay on for Q&A at the end. So, so please feel free to use that. Uh, let me know if you can hear clearly. Um, otherwise, let's get started. So uh, first of all, uh, who are we? What do we do? Uh, why are you listening to us? Um, uh, Kind of representing Rand Swiss, uh, we do a whole lot of different things. So we do uh, stock broking, uh, which is covered in our online trading and private broking. Online trading, you basically do everything yourself. Um, you know, the private broking, that's for slightly larger accounts. It's if you want that old school uh, broking service. Uh, we kind of chat to you through positions. You can ask us for research and, and really just help. We help you build a portfolio, but you are the ultimate decision maker on the securities that we are buying and selling. Manage portfolios, which this, uh, this webinar supports, as well as this webinar supports everyone in, in, in the stockbroking uh, community at Rand Swiss, whether you're trading yourself. Hopefully, this will generate some ideas. Private broking, you want to kind of come and chat to us afterwards and, and really get some of the, the deep dive research that we're going to cover now. A lot of it is based on the sell side analytics work by the likes of Deutsche Bank and, and JP Morgan. If you are interested in those companies and you have a private broking account with us, just ask us and, and we'll kind of take you through those, those research notes in more detail. Of course, managed portfolios, that's where you're saying, hey, I like you guys, I like what you're saying. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of cash. Why don't you, why don't you manage a portfolio for me? Uh, we have a whole lot of different strategies. I usually focus on the global equity portfolio because it's just, it, it touches on, on almost everything in the, the market. Um, Viv Gavinder runs our structured products, uh, medium risk products. He's got some interesting things going on there. Um, we've just closed the one that we talked about last month. And uh, there's a new one that's coming out that can only be held at our Swiss bank. Uh, also a very interesting product. Um, it's going to have 30% capital protection. Um, and it's giving a, it's basically an auto call. It's going to give you 14.5% in US dollars currently backed into UBS. Uh, very, very interesting product. Uh, you can hit Viv up about that. Offshore transfers, it supports everything. A lot of uh, uh, money these days uh, is, uh, I suppose, is deployed internationally. So this just helps us, you know, you have one, bring your, your funds back, but also take your funds out at exceptionally low rates. It makes the whole administration of international uh, international wealth management uh, a lot easier. Wealth management, the more holistic uh, view, kind of Yaku, Yaku Iga, our certified financial planner, heads that up. And it's really when you want to take into account more than just the securities portfolio. If you want to kind of look at the holistic view of, of, your, of your investments and, uh, and you know, even take into account your risk. It's like, yeah, am I insured correctly? That's, that's what, uh, that's what he, he does. Um, and then finally, Vanna running our tax-free savings accounts, which we have uh, won some awards for. Uh, twice in a row we've been named, so 2020 and 2021, we are the best tax-free savings uh, account provider in South Africa, according to the Financial Mail and Intellidex. Um, we are also the, the top uh, stockbroker for 20, or top securities broker, at least, for 2021. Uh, the awards are in 2022, uh, September. That's when the, I'll ask you guys to vote. And hopefully, if you've liked all the content that we've been producing and uh, you, you've enjoyed the service that you've received at Rand Swiss, I really would uh, ask you to take the, the, the 20, 25 minutes, because it is quite an in-depth survey, and fill it in honestly and see and, and see if we can we can rank again, well again. Um, Overall, it's been a fantastic journey for us over the last seven years. I mean, we are an unlisted business. Uh, we're a small operation. We are sitting in the JSC building again. I'll just flip for you and you can see Yaku and our offices that way. Uh, so we do sit in the JSC building, but we are not a big bank. We're not a huge broker. Standard Bank, PSG, FNB, GT247, Easy Equity, SAS, and all of these brokers are listed huge um, kind of bank brokers. Uh, we're the little guys. So, you know, we, we, we really do appreciate the support. And as we grow, um, as long as we can kind of keep the quality of service, uh, I think there are very, very positive things in our future. And, uh, you know, everything that we, we essentially charge and earn, we try and pass back to either better research, better analysis, uh, better platforms, better costs. Uh, better education and, and just a, a generally a better experience. So that's Rand Swiss. That's what we do. So, so with that uh, kind of introduction out of the way, let's move on to what uh, what we're going to cover today and what what's been happening in the world. 
Um, so we have shifted the structure of this webinar a little bit over the last uh, last couple of months. Uh, I'm going to start kind of with the headlines, what, what's happened. You know, last month when we chatted, we chatted quite late in the month. Um, we checked in March, but everything was Russia. We did a big analysis of Russia. You can uh, get that uh, YouTube clip. It's all up on YouTube on our channel. Uh, if you're interested in hearing kind of the analysis of what we thought the, the potential scenarios are around Russia, but essentially the, the headlines were dominated. It, there was no economic news. There was there was nothing because the, the world was just absolutely swamped by you know Ukraine invasion, nuclear plants being attacked. I mean, it, it was a it was a scary scary time where the, where I think the attention of the, the world was very, very focused. Um, you know, I gave you guys a, a mini portfolio that Viv built for us. Uh, it's just a, a 10 stock portfolio of defense contractors and defense stocks. Um, that's in that uh, presentation if you're interested. Uh, you can either request it from, from info at ranswiss.com or, or like I said, you can go and uh, find it on the YouTube channel. Um, and the idea was, you know, the, the world is changing significantly and we're going to see increased defense spending. Um, uh, the, defense spending. That's kind of what was happening February and, and the beginning of March. Um, so what's happening now? Uh, so we've seen a big shift kind of in the, in the global narrative, uh, far less, I mean, yes, absolutely, Ukraine and Russia is, is you know, right top of mind still, but you're starting to get the sense that the, the, the world's attention is starting to shift, uh, especially if you, you're tracking kind of major uh, top line news. Um, towards uh, back to kind of more the economic situation and the in, one the impact of what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine, but also just the, those kind of typical typical economic uh, announcements as well. And there have been some other big moves. So one of the things that have really has really dominated the conversation towards the end of March is the idea that we we have an inverted yield curve. So um, this is uh, quite a technical indicator, but it's basically when uh, you, you know if you look at the normal yield curve, you would expect uh, yields to be higher on long data debt than short data debt. Uh, obviously, why, why would you expect interest rates to be higher on long data debt? If you're lending someone money for 30 years, you're probably going to ask for a little bit, uh, a little bit more uh, compensation for such a long-term loan, uh, because there's more chance in that time period that they might default, they might not give your money back. Uh, if you're looking at a short, short-term loan, let's say a two-year loan, um, you know, you're, you're, you know, all things being equal, if the credit risk of the person is the same person, just because the time is shorter, you would expect that uh, that to be a little bit, uh, a little bit lower. You wouldn't demand as much of a coupon uh, to lend someone money. So a normal yield curve uh, should kind of slope upwards as the duration gets longer. What's happened now is your short dated yield, your short dated bonds are actually demanding a higher um, coupon. Uh, than, than the longer dated bond, and that's called a yield curve inversion. Now, what that is, is a technical signal that there's almost, uh, there's a high probability of a recession coming. Every single recession, um, I think going back about 100 years, has been preceded by a yield curve inversion. So when the, the two and tens, so that's the, the two-year treasury yield, um, you know, moved higher than the 10-year treasury yield, uh, and the yield curve inversion happened, everyone kind of panic stations, we're going into recession. Now, this is an indicator you know that it's 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 almost a a quantitative indicator for the qualitative kind of things that we've been seeing going on in the world. You know, we've had massive supply chain disruptions from COVID. We've had you know big disruptions and changes in the way that the global society our global society works. Everything from work from home to back to offices to you know people being locked down to to yeah to to you know war it's been it's been a very very intense period and this is now a technical indicator that's starting to say wait a minute in the next kind of six to six to 24 months things are going to get very very tough which i think is is kind of what we're expecting definitely and it's what we were chatting about last time just about food price inflation but some of that news that we were talking about last time the impact of what what the the russian war is going to mean uh, Russian Ukraine war is going to mean is that we are going to see much, much higher uh, inflation prices. So inflation is going to rise. Um, it's, you know, our view internally is, I mean, we, we've never believed in the, the, the argument that it was going to be transitory. We've believed for a long time that uh, that inflation uh, was going to become embedded in the system. And that's why it's so crucial to look at those uh, US labor market statistics, which we're going to look at in a little bit. Uh, but then we've also had uh, some other big announcements. Um, you know, this is kind of an early headline from CNN. China, 37 million people uh, in, in lockdown. So remember, China has been following a zero COVID policy. So they've been very, very strict on, on, on uh, you know, basically movement across borders and, and trying to control the spread of COVID. And they haven't developed the kind of immunity that potentially other populations have. Uh, what that has meant is, uh, you know, big, big swaths of China have gone back into lockdown, which is, you, you know, 
there's a couple of different views that we've picked up from our research uh, meeting on this. And, and one, data out of China is always very, very opaque. Now, if this was just the Omicron variant going wide in China, um, you would expect uh, you would expect the Chinese authorities almost to to let it burn out. I mean, you know, if 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 it is a virus that you know, if you compare it to something like influenza, is less virulent, less uh, has a lower mortality rate, less people die from 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 Omicron co the, the Omicron variant of COVID, statistically speaking, than, than something like the flu. Why would China institute such an incredibly harsh lockdown? Um, so there is, you know, kind of like the, the more fringe idea floating around there that uh, this could be a different type of virus or a different type of variant completely that is a lot more dangerous. Now, you know, looking at kind of, uh, you know, the way that viruses mutate, maybe not. Like I said, it is a fringe idea, but, uh, but there's no question that this kind of like heavy lockdown that we're seeing in China is going to have real world economic ramifications. Uh, this is affecting uh, parts of China that are incredibly productive in terms of, um, of goods and services. Uh, and of course, China, China being the manufacturing base of the world, uh, this will affect again prices. It's going to make uh, supply chain. It's going to once again uh, exacerbate the problems that we're seeing in supply chains. And it's everything from you can't get ink for your pen uh, to to you know just certain products not being available on the shelves because because of that kind of disruption. And ultimately, when supply when you're going through a supply shock, supply. Um, you know, if you move kind of the supply curve, it, it does inflate, you know, when you move the supply curve, the, the, the prices do increase. So, so we would, it again, exacerbates the inflation story. Um, we are seeing like the Russia-Ukraine situation obviously hasn't gone away. It's still front page news almost everywhere. The most recent kind of updates are that the US and the EU are going to toughen sanctions against uh, Russia once again. We've seen again incredibly disturbing images coming out of Russia and, and, and the kind of uh, the kind of hu human tragedy there is, is just incredible. Um, but obviously with sanctions increasing, that's going to feed into commodity prices specifically. Uh, you know, Ukraine and Russia, you look at, uh, you know, their, their share of uh, spe specifically in the nitrogen cycle and um, their share of uh, wheat exports, and it's significant. It, it is going to have a long-term impact uh, on, on us, and it's going to change, I think, the, the way that things work. Um, you know, again, out of our research meetings, we, we've got the idea that uh, this is going to be particularly difficult for emerging market economies. Um, you know, with rising food prices, that's obviously a much larger component of the, of the spend of, of, of poorer people. Um, you know, in a developed uh, a nation where per capita income is higher, uh, you might be spending, say, 5% of your income on food. Um, that might move up to 10% with, with food price inflation. But if you're in a kind of a low income economy, uh, you might be spending 30 to 40 to 50% of your income on food. If food price doubles in there, you, are, you immediately fall underwater. And, you know, when, when food prices are affected, that's where you see real civil unrest. Um, as, uh, as, as we've discussed, this is what gets, uh, you know, men will go out in the street and riot, but when women are out in the street, that's, that's, that's when you know that there's a, a systemic problem. Um, and uh, you know, rising food prices, will, 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 that will happen. So um, that leads to political instability. It, it, it is a real, real issue. Um, and it's why we've kind of maintained more of a developed market focus at, at this stage. Um, you know, looking at looking at emerging markets, and I kind of have been saying for a while that you know we could get a swing up into emerging markets. Uh, it's just a change of narrative, but I think this is you know this kind of disruption uh, is going to lead to some some difficult uh, difficult political situations in in many developing markets. So our kind of view is uh, probably still overweight uh, developed developed economies. Um, of course, we also had weird. Will Smith resigns from the Academy after slapping Chris Rock. What was Will Smith thinking? But that, for me, the reason I've put that headline up, not an economic headline, not a business headline, but it also, it was just such a crazy event that, that the, you almost saw the, the world's attention breaking from, from such laser focus on, on, on Europe and, and the war in Europe. And it was almost something that just almost signaled that, that the attention is starting to flag, which is is incredibly sad in a way, but but also at the same time, it's it's something that I think uh, you know if you look at what's happened, uh, Putin understands this. You know, the, the the global attention span is quite short, and and if you can continue a war for long enough, 
uh, eventually the, the the media's attention will shift, and, and we saw that under uh, with coronavirus as well. Eventually, you just get that kind of news headline fatigue, and and people start start to move on, and and that kind of idea that Will Smith slapped Chris Rock, and the, the world was yeah, that was kind of like trending on on on, on social media feeds far more than, than than the atrocities that we're seeing in Ukraine. Um, it's just for me, it was just a little signal that uh, that you know attention is focused, and obviously attention is so is so crucial to sentiment. And that's why I've got the the fear and greed index up on the left hand side. Remember when we looked at it last year? This is a, a CNN uh, fear and greed index. You can find it on CNN Money. It's a composite of a whole lot of different indicators, including the VIX. We're going to look at the VIX specifically, but they've got a whole lot of indicators that feed into this index, and it gives a, a, a gauge of where market sentiment was. Now, one month ago when we did this presentation, we were actually below 21 because, like I said, the month's not exact. Uh, we do this on kind of different days every month, but we were in extreme fear mode. We were looking at Russia. There was literally pet, like bombs being lobbed at nuclear power stations. There was the threat of nuclear war. It was a terrifying, terrifying situation. I, I get the sense that the market has settled. The nerves are starting to settle and, 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 the, and the global attention is starting to shift. We're seeing that in underlying pricing as well. So, uh, and when I say underlying pricing, specifically equity pricing, uh, but we've, we've seen that needle tick all the way back up from extreme fear into the neutral gauge. And we've seen volatility reducing. We've seen a, a bit of a rise in some of the tech companies as well. Um, and you can see there's just a chart of fear and greed over time. So we've actually, the market has kind of settled a little bit in the last month. Um, and yeah, I think I've just also included one headline. Biden announces US, UK, and Australia in cooperation with hypersonic weapons. These are obviously a type of weapon that's being used, but uh, you know, that travels at 10 times the, the speed of sound. Uh, and uh, essentially no uh, missile defense system at the moment on, on the planet can, can guard against them. Um, but what were well, the reason I brought this headline up again, the, the idea that defense spending is going to pick up and some of those defense contractors might benefit. Uh, I think that thesis, you know, it's, it's not a flash in the pan. There's certain things that you've got to look at in, in financial markets and kind of almost take a step back um, and go, no, wait a minute, this is a great headline and great news, but, but headlines, while it's, it's great to kind of understand the sentiment and the, and, and the, the, the environment that you're working in. I mean, we have to work with, with what's, what's going on in the world, uh, but at the same time, you, you kind of got to pick and choose what to ignore. Now, our, our view is that uh, defense spending around the world is going to increase significantly for some time to come. So that defense basket may be still an interesting idea. Uh, an example of a headline that maybe you shouldn't be too worried about. So normally every month we pick one headline just to have a look at. Um, Elon Musk takes a 9.2% stake in Twitter. So immediately the question that we've been asked by clients, I've been asked in the media as well is, you know, are you buying Twitter? Does this change your view of what could potentially happen at Twitter? Is Twitter now a company that it's never been particularly uh, exciting to, to analysts and, and investors? It hasn't given the returns of, of something like Facebook. Um, you know, it's it's been an interesting story. It's, it's a fantastic platform. I mean, especially for financial people, it's, it's uh, often you find news uh, arriving on Twitter before you find it arriving on terminals. So it's a great source of information for, for financial markets. But at the same time, and especially like sentiment, and you, you, know, you can get a lot out of uh, fin Twitter, as they call it. Um, but it hasn't really been an investment, uh, <laughs> investment case. I see someone's asking, is that an NFT? <laughs> so non-fungible token, I, I don't know. I, I might be uh, infringing on someone's uh, non-fungible non token. But um, uh, looking at, uh, yeah, looking at uh, Elon Musk taking a stake, what has happened with that? Obviously, immediately we've seen Twitter's share price uh, react like a Dogecoin. So, um, you know, whenever Elon Musk takes a, a stake in something, uh, whenever he starts to get involved in something, you know, that, that uh, you, people can, can buy and sell, um, you almost immediately see price action. So Twitter literally moved over 25% in a single day uh, with the announcement that he had bought. Uh, the, he is now the largest shareholder of Twitter, but does this really matter? Um, yes, it does matter because uh, Twitter is one of the few technology companies that actually doesn't have um, a special voting right control structure in place. Uh, so what happens is even if you had a majority stake in something like Google, um, you you would st the, the voting rights still sit with with the with the founders. Twitter is not like that. Now Twitter has gone through a couple of management changes. Re or management, I say management changes, but Jack Dorsey, uh, the founder, has stepped back. Parag Agarwal. Uh, has taken over and he was seen as a very safe set of hands for for twitter 
and he the idea behind it was that he was going to kind of move it into 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 the uh, I suppose the 21st century and, and kind of you know be able to make it a little bit more stable platform uh, you know appease the regulators and 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 keep things on an even keel and start to make it a little bit more profitable for shareholders. Uh, Elon Musk doesn't like this. I mean, obviously, there's all sorts of uh, questions about how Twitter uh, Twitter's uh, free speech policy. I mean, they ban Donald Trump, uh, but they allow pornography. It's 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 a it's a weird platform, and and, and I think weird decisions have been made on top. Elon Musk has taken a stake now, and he you know as part of this, he he put out a tweet. Um, that uh, kind of questioning the idea of whether or not uh, Twitter was upholding the principles of free speech. And we know Elon Musk is a, is a huge pundit for, for free speech. He, he sees it as essential to democracy. So, so you know, he, he kind of asked the question a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, should, uh, should we look at creating uh, an alternative social media platform? Everyone kind of went berserk on that. He put out a, a tweet with the, um, you know, doing the poll about whether or not Twitter was upholding democracy, uh, upholding free speech. And, uh, and, you know, unfortunately, he had already bought, in, started buying into Twitter. So uh, he hadn't yet made the disclosure. He didn't make the disclosure in the required time limit. So the SEC is now incredibly unhappy with him. Now, he's never really been too concerned about what the SEC says. You'll remember with uh, Tesla, where he said, um, you know, funding secured for 20. Um, and of course, there was no funding, and this was seen as market manipulation. Um, looking at it, uh, you know, reading kind of the, the commentary around uh, what could potentially happen to Elon Musk because of this, um, they're saying I think the maximum fine that can be levied uh, is something like 200,000 US dollars, which is, I mean, obviously that can change and you can change the rules. Uh, but when you, you're worth uh, $267 billion, uh, or two, depending on where Tesla's share price is at the time, probably not a, a huge concern for you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly interesting and, and very interesting to see if he does make the algorithm open source or, you know, he's been appointed to the board. What, what will this mean for Twitter? Is Twitter a buy? Uh, it's difficult to say. So from, I, I, you know, personally, I probably wouldn't be diving into it because, you know, this is, represents, uh, you know, an absolutely uh, fraction. Uh, it's, it will be, you know, maybe 1% of Elon Musk's uh, fortune. Uh, for him, this could literally be a joke. <laughs> that he, that, you know, he, he could be doing it just, just for fun. Um, he could legitimately be doing it uh, because he has free speech concerns. Uh, he might see it as an incredibly powerful mouthpiece that he wants more control of. It's very difficult to understand why and, and what, what the idea is behind it. Um, you know, you've got kind of like what the, the speculation in the media and, and even what he says, it might not be exactly, um, you, you know, what the truth is. So would you be buying Twitter at this stage? I mean, obviously, the, the, the consensus expectations are a little bit uh, like, so, so these are just the estimates of Bloomberg. Um, the potential return after the share price spike, and I don't think we've seen analysts reacting yet with, with research notes and price target uh, changes, uh, but you have four sales on the company, 20, uh, 29 holds, uh, nine buys. Um, the implied potential return is uh, is negative 12.9%. And even after the spike, uh, the, the, the last 12 month return is negative 23%. So you can see Twitter, you know, if you look at the chart on the left hand side, still very much in a downtrend, even with that spike, it's kind of spiked up to that uh, 200 day simple moving average. Um, and, you know, if, if it does manage to break that without falling back a little bit, uh, you might see it moving all the way up to, to kind of that long-term trend line. So maybe a little bit more into it, but I kind of feel like you needed to be in this before Elon Musk's spike. We're definitely not adding it to the global managed portfolios. We're not asking clients to go and buy Twitter because Elon Musk is suddenly involved in Twitter. Let's see how the story pans out. This is an example of a headline that maybe I wouldn't be jumping uh, on the back of to uh, try and write up. If you want to have a punt and have a little bit of fun, um, yeah, it, uh, it could be... It could be interesting to see, but let's let's see how it plays out and, and what the, the ultimate end game is, because I, I, I don't personally see the ultimate end game at this stage. That's why I'm staying out. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the economic indicators. That was just the kind of headlines. I spent a little bit maybe too long on the headlines, but uh, now let's look at the US economy quickly. We've got some new data out. Um, so 
Okay, annual inflation rate. Okay, we did, like I said, we did this uh, presentation. So we actually, we already had inflation figures for March in, in last month's presentation. Uh, we can see inflation in the US is, is moving up aggressively. So the next inflation print is going to be out on the 12th of April. Um, the expectation is for 8.3%. So we're currently sitting at 7.9% uh, US inflation rate. That is astounding, much higher, much higher than South Africa. Uh, the U.S. inflating at a rapid, rapid pace, uh, part of its supply chain disruptions, but we're starting to see real uh, wage growth uh, coming through. Um, if you look at the U.S. unemployment rate, we got uh, the non-farm payroll figures out on, uh, on uh, last Friday. And uh, yeah, we saw an increase of 431,000 uh, jobs in March. It was below estimates, so we're expecting 490,000. Uh, but unemployment rate in the US is now at 3.6%. You know, below 4% used to be considered frictional. Just before the coronavirus, they, they did dip below, below the 4%. And we were looking at it going, geez, I can't believe unemployment is, is, is this low in the US. Uh, if you look at the expanded measures, so remember, unemployment takes into account only um, people that are actively looking for work. So if you if you take into account a, a wider view of em employment, which uh, includes discouraged workers, the U.S. is sitting at 6.9% uh, unemployment, uh, still still incredibly low. And what we're starting to see is we're starting to see that uh, real wages are are rising. Now, real wages rose at 5.6% um, in, in the, the non-farm payroll number. Uh, so the, they are still rising behind uh, the annual inflation rate. So essentially, workers in the US are getting poorer. Now, what that also means is that you can probably expect, you know, unless we see a moderation in, in, the, in the top line inflation number, which is not expected, we're expecting it to go to 8.3%. You know, I, I think our house view is that we, we, there's a real possibility that we'll see double digit inflation in, in the US in the next uh, year or so. Um, the, the idea that wages are going to need to start to rise more quickly and, and the more wages rise, the more that inflation becomes embedded in the system and the more difficult it becomes for, for the Federal Reserve and, and Jerome Powell to, to conquer inflation. You'll remember that uh, you know, when we went through a period of stagflation uh, in the 70s, it took Paul Volcker essentially hiking interest rates so aggressively that he sent the, the US into a recession. Um, then really thinking this still isn't good enough high, hiking more uh, off, just after the US got out of recession, sending it back into recession. Now, is Jerome Powell and is there the political will to, to do that uh, and in, in the modern economy? This is a debate that, that goes on and on. But you do get the sense that the, the Fed is going to be a little bit behind uh, the curve when it comes to, to inflation. You can see if you look at the US federal funds rates, um, we have lift off at last. So we have seen a hike in the, you'll see that little tick uh, right at the end, you'll see we, we've had interest rates uh, moving higher uh, in the US for the first time, but forecasts are for, for you know, basically rate hikes at, in, the, in the US at, at every single one of the meetings uh, going forward. So, you know, different banks have different estimates. Some are saying 25 basis points at every meeting. Others have 50 basis point hikes penciled in. But uh, the idea that we are going to see much more aggressive uh, rate hikes in the near future uh, is, is kind of a given. Um, you know, with inflation running rampant as it is and, and, and uh, you know, growth to an extent starting to stall. We haven't got uh, new GDP figures out yet, but um, it, uh, it looks like we're heading into a tough time. And uh, again, that yield curve inversion is, is, um, is uh, supporting that. Uh, so yeah, if we look at the SA economy, so our inflation a little bit more moderate, our inflation print for, for last month coming in at 5.7%. Um, we are still within our target band, but you, know, you get the sense that this can't last. Um, yeah, I think the stronger currency is helping us uh, not to import inflation uh, via the oil price because we are a net oil importer. But um, I don't know, like, can 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 the U.S. be inflating at eight point three percent in South Africa? You know, maintain a fire, You know, maintain an inflation rate in its target band. I think it's going to be very very difficult. I mean, you know, we we have seen uh, our unemployment new unemployment figures. So remember when Viv and I did our you know, global outlook for the year. Um, you know, we were sitting at 34.9% unemployment. And one of the questions was, do you think unemployment will dip below 35% in 2022? Um, we're at 35.3. So remember, it was a kind of a fringe, we always try and make those questions difficult and make them quite, quite binary, like 
you know, we, we don't we don't allow any easy easy wins on those questions. Um, but the first the first uh, real unemployment print is in 35.3. So we are above 35 percent inflation, at least 35 percent unemployment in, in in South Africa, and that's you know the official measure of unemployment. I'm not looking at youth unemployment or anything like that, which is much much higher. Um, but that trend is still very, very clear, exactly the opposite to the US trend. Um, unemployment in South Africa is still a massive, massive problem. Um, yes, rising commodity prices are, st are helping South Africa in an enormous way. It is helping with SARS revenue connection, which is allowing for um, you know, wonderful things to happen, like uh, Moody's upgrading our uh, outlook from negative to stable. I mean, Moody's was the ratings agency that was more, um, I suppose, benign in its assessment of South, of South African credit. But um, yeah, looking at it at least, it's still two notches below, uh, two, still two notches below junk at, at BA, a, BA2. But, um, but yeah, a positive step for South Africa. And, and part of that is just uh, the, the additional revenue from rising commodity prices that helping to stabilize the, the debt to GDP ratio. And, um, and, you know, that's a good thing. But I think our, our estimate is that, uh, you know, the structural unemployment in South Africa is, is not going away anytime soon. Um, as you can see, the South African uh, repo rate uh, has to track what, what happens in, in, in the, uh, with, with the federal uh, funds rate. So we've had another interest rate increase in South Africa. So from our point of view, when we're looking at our money market products, we've switched all our clients out of the traditional, uh, uh, basically, money fund accounts, which uh, a money fund is essentially short dated debt. Um, that the interest rate fluctuates slightly, but you know, as you get an interest rate hike, your, your rate kind of creeps up behind the interest rate. We've switched to the prime money call accounts, which basically means that when, when interest rate goes up, you immediately get the benefit of that increased interest rate. Um, and and uh, I suppose those money market accounts are becoming more and more attractive because uh, obviously that interest rate is passed on each time. I see uh, we, we hold them through Investec and I see Investec now offering, you know, six, six and a half, uh, six and a half percent on some of their fixed deposits. Um, so becoming a more uh, interesting asset class, but uh, still for me, you know, yes, it's difficult for equities, but longer term, if, you, if you've got a five year horizon, um, with inflation sitting at 5.7%, uh, I don't think you go, you know, and, and that's the official rate of inflation in South Africa. I think you're going to see inflation ticking up in South Africa over the next uh, next couple of months. I don't see how we're going to avoid it uh, with commodity prices doing what they are doing. Um, I think you might, you know, you put a you fix you put in a fixed deposit for for three to five years, six percent. I think you're going to look out in in two three years and you're going to go, wow, that's a low interest rate that I'm getting when I could put it on a fixed deposit at a higher rate. So in a rising interest rate cycle, maybe yes, the call account's fine for parking cash. Nice, nice that you get a little bit of extra interest, but definitely not a long term solution for us. Long term solution still very much uh, deployment into uh, into the equity market or at least quasi equity products. Um, you, know, you can have a bond component underneath it, but we want some sort of index payoff on top of that. Um, I say growth rates lackluster. We've been lackluster for a while. Um, looking at commodity markets, uh, commodity prices are still very, very elevated. So there's just kind of the snapshot. We're going to look at uh, each of them. So over the last month, uh, we have seen almost a sideways tracking of, of commodity prices. We haven't seen any you know, further exacerbated price moves, uh, you know, even though we have China moving back into lockdown, we haven't seen that affecting commodity prices uh, extensively. Um, this is just the Bloomberg Commodity Index versus the Refinitiv Core Commodity Index. They're very, very similar indices, so they track each other. Uh, as I said, last, last month, we were looking at that initial spike. It was just an absolutely wild month. Um, we did get a, a correction when I think when we met last time, we, we were looking at that correction. Commodity prices have moved up again, but the volatility is still very, very high in the commodity markets and still e e like elevated a long way above its uh, kind of long, longer term what, what's, uh, where, where commodity price moves have been in the past. Um, we look at oil markets, oil has moderated. So that 120, now part of this is a release from, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of factors uh, at play in the oil markets currently. Um, you know, obviously the, the idea that Russian oil is, 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 Russia is under sanctions is taking a lot of supply out of the market. Um, there is hope that uh, the US will, uh, the, the Iranian, uh, I suppose, Iranian agreements will be reached. Uh, that could potentially 
basically bring back 1.3 million barrels per day, and that will uh, uh, you know, relieve some of the, the, the supply side constraints. But at the same time, we've seen across the world, I and mean, even in South Africa, um, you know, releases from strategic uh, petroleum reserves as well to try and just stabilize prices. Um, that has helped to keep a lid on, on prices. I'm sure uh, OPEC is, is looking at, uh, at increasing supply into, into a market this high. Uh, at the same time, as, as we normally said, uh, you know, the, this kind of supply shock that we've seen that took oil uh, you know, well above $130 a barrel um, has moderated. I always thought that was temporary. Um, I, I kind of think that the ideal range for oil is probably between 70 and, and 90. Um, I think you know, too, higher than that, you get a very quick, uh, well, not a quick move, but you get an incredibly aggressive move into, alternative, into alternatives. That's not what OPEC wants. Um, I believe that's the range that OPEC uh, wants the oil price to be in. Um, of course, you know, short-term supply shocks, you know, OPEC it can't bring on, on oil production as fast. Yes, there have been regulatory changes in the US and, and with by the Biden administration is far more green. So yeah, maybe, maybe the shale guys aren't going to come back on stream anytime soon and maybe we'll have elevated uh, oil prices for some time to come. Uh, but at the same time, you know, even in South Africa, you know, there's been reductions in the fuel price levy just to help uh, ease this, this, this shock. Um, but, you, you know, at, at higher prices, more production comes on stream because uh, more, more wells are profitable and uh, the, the market economy uh, does its job and, and hopefully oil prices come down eventually. But uh, you have seen a little bit of a moderation in, in oil. I mean, yesterday we were trading, I think today we're trading about $108 a barrel. Um, and I would expect, you know, in the next year to see oil prices, you know, back, back below 100. That would be my expectation. Um, I'll be very surprised if we're at, I mean, I've seen Goldman Sachs and um, Morgan Stanley estimates of, of oil prices hitting $200 a, a barrel. Um, it's it's possible, I suppose, but uh, I think I, I don't see it at this stage. I think I think we're going to get a moderation. Um, if we if we look at okay, so this is just a soft performance. Uh, I've just kind of put the little bar, little blue box around what's happening uh, on the soft commodity prices. Um, I've put all the, uh, the the colors in there. So when we share the presentation, if you want to go and have a look at it uh, more more more. With, in more detail, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, but yeah, the, the, big, the big price move of, uh, let's say, the last uh, five, six years has actually been, been coffee uh, coffee futures. And that's the green line up at the top. You can see coffee prices going up again. Remember, we hold Starbucks in our portfolio. Starbucks uh, actually benefits from higher, like weirdly in the short term, uh, it benefits from higher commodity prices because of... Um, by higher, at least higher coffee prices, because they have a quite an aggressive hedging strategy in place and they can hedge at very, very attractive rates. Um, that uh, works well for them um, against some of their competitors who can't do the, the kind of hedging that they do. Um, so they actually end up, uh, you know, basically, you know, with, with better margins for the short term. They can't obviously have coffee at uh, high prices for incredibly long times, uh, otherwise the input costs will, will start to increase as well. But uh, coffee is up. I always keep a track on that just because, because of uh, our interest in Starbucks. Um, yeah, the rest of the stuff. So, so basically, you know, a little bit of a spike, uh, you, you know, kind of tick, ticking back up uh, again um, in the last month, you know, looking at uh, frozen concentrated orange juice, which is actually a really a fungible contract. So you can and sell these exact cubes of orange juice. It's, uh, it's what you trade. Um, frozen concentrated orange juice, uh, big, big spike up over the last month. And that's just as food price inflation, I would assume, is, is working through the system. Um, you know, the kind of big spikes that we've seen in, in, in natural gas prices, uh, thanks to the, the disruptions in Europe, um, have uh, have uh, you know you haven't have we haven't spiked back up in the last month, but still very very elevated, and you can start to see the natural gas prices. Um, you know the purple one, which is NGC one, um, which is kind of NYMEX Henry Hub natural gas. Uh, you know ticking ticking high steadily higher now. Not a not a big spike shock. But, but definitely, definitely moving higher. So energy prices still very, very elevated. If you've got any friends in Europe, ask them about uh, what they're paying for their gas bills, uh, their heating bills, and their electricity bills. And it is scary, very, very scary. Um, so looking at currency markets, so again, 
Uh, unfortunately, yeah. So, so for, fortunately, we have both terminals. We've got Reuters and Bloomberg at the moment. But um, you know, looking at it, we normally look at the Reuters forecasts for um, you, you know just the twelve month forecast on on the, the Rand dollar contract. Um, there's been no change. So these are the same numbers as as last month because they haven't yet conducted their poll, even though it is the sixth. Normally they do it around the third or the fourth of the month. Um, there's no new new polling data out uh, from Reuters yet. Uh, which is the monthly poll that they run. Um, so this is still still last month's uh, polling data. Um, you can see that uh, the, the most, so as of last month, the most bullish bank was Standard Chartered Bank with a with a 12 month target of 1440. We almost hit 1440 last month. So you know, just looking at the technicals on this uh, on on this chart, um, you know, we did a I did a, a currency note for for all, all the clients um, about two months ago. Uh, we had 1440 as our lower lower level. Um, part of it based on on these kind of estimates, but just on the technical level, we were kind of looking at long term um, support, uh, a long term horizontal support, and saying 1440 seems to be where the market could find a, a lower level. We had three, three level. We normally do three levels up, three levels down. Um, that that has held. I mean, we went, we tested that 1440 level a couple of times this month. Uh, we're bouncing back up. We had about 1470, just under 1470 at the moment on on the rand dollar contract. Um, we bought broke that very weak short term horizontal resistance, and I suppose can it get stronger from here? I mean, it's it's a it's an incredible question. Not one of the big banks um, is is estimating it, the currency to be stronger here, but Part of the reason is that with stronger commodity prices and, and South Africa being seen as a commodity uh, kind of commodity driven uh, economy, um, when commodity prices rise, um, the South African rand becomes quite attractive. You look at our inflation figures; we are also quite attractive. Our, you know, if you look at real yields in South Africa, we are, are far better than the U.S. I mean, look at where our interest rate is compared to our inflation rate. Look at where the U.S. interest rate is compared to its inflation rate. Suddenly, the South African currency doesn't look so bad. Another way you can look at it on a relative basis is to compare South Africa to somewhere like Russia or Turkey, which are kind of emerging market peers. Both of them are essentially uninvestable now. So a lot of emerging market fund managers are probably looking at South Africa as the least worst option, even though we do have massive problems around you know, our, our state-owned entities and, and what we're going to do in terms of the, the funding. Um, you know, we have you know, structural unemployment at, at absolutely scary levels. Um, we are not, you know, everything is not suddenly fine in South Africa, but on a relative basis, hey, we're not, we're not attacking our neighbors, and that's uh, probably a good thing. We're also hiking interest rates into an inflation cycle instead of reducing interest rates like Turkey. So, yeah, maybe, you know, I, and, and again, our Reserve Bank is, I've said it before on these calls, but our Reserve Bank is an incredibly strong institution. It's, um, it's really something that we should be very, very proud of. It's, uh, you know, managed to avoid a lot of the political influence and, 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 and hold on to its independence in, in, in a very admirable way. Um, and I think we have very, very responsible central bankers in South Africa. So it's one of the reasons that I think our currency has done very, very well this year. Um, surprised a lot of people, but then uh, it's been a very, very surprising year. Um, looking at the estimates, so, so sorry, that's just on the technical basis. The next level down, if we do, is probably going to, if we, if we have to get stronger, is about 14, uh, 14 flat. Um, I have been taking out cash again, 14, 14.45 is my average on, on actually just taking currency contracts, not for clients or managed portfolios, but that's where I believe the, the exit point should be. Um, I do think that you're going to get a moderation back up to that declining trend line there. I would say, you know, you would then be bringing currency back probably 50 15, 15 to 15, 20 would be the range that you should be bringing currency back into the, the market. That would take you up to the top of the, the relative strength index, that RSI that I've got down at the bottom. If we hit 15, 50, that would then be an overbought territory and we'd, you'd be wanting to sell USD czar contracts. Um, like I said, those are old forecasts, but fortunately we have a Bloomberg terminal now as well. So um, this is just the date of Bloomberg. I've given you the underlying banks and the estimates. Um, so having a look at it, uh, they have even more <laughs> bearish banks. So yeah, they, they're obviously looking at a different segment. They've also got their recommendation uh, dates. So JP Morgan at, uh, you, you know, I'm just going to look at the big ones. JP Morgan on the 14th of March, 
uh, they, they, um, basically their estimate one year out, 1675, very, very bearish on our currency. Uh, you look at the likes of Barclays, 1525, much higher than where we are now. Uh, they the most optimistic bank, according to Bloomberg, and this, uh, you know, this was from the 18th of March, uh, Morgan Stanley saying 1380. Uh, is a potential target. So that's their downside target. I would say 14 is probably going to catch. They might, they might get there, but they obviously are a lot more constructive on, on the South African outlook than, than most of the, the other polled uh, brokers and banks. Uh, BNP Barrow about 1520. Um, you know, looking at Q1 of 2022, the banks and the brokers were on uh, the Bloomberg banks and brokers were. Uh, more more bearish uh, than they should have been. Their forecast for Q1 2022 was an average of 1550. Uh, the actual was 1461. So, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit pessimistic on South Africa. Maybe South Africa, not too bad. But again, starting to be reflected in, in the prices. Um, just having a look at the, the currency market as well. So looking at the GDP czar, uh, these are the same levels that we put on last time, which was just basically the old horizontal support around 19. Uh, the market has broken down and, and pinged that support and starts to be heading back up. Uh, if you're a technical analyst, that might be an inverse head and shoulders starting to form down at the bottom there. But you do obviously have a, a decline trend line there. The trend is absolutely broken. Uh, something that's also probably worth bearing in mind. Um, this is a 200-day simple moving average overlaid on a 21-day simple moving average. So if you're into the technicals, um, that would be a death cross. Death cross, it depends which way. Currency is a bit different. So golden cross and death cross are the two opposites. Uh, but if you, I suppose if you're looking at the GBP czar pair specifically, that would be a, um, a death cross for the GBP against czar, uh, but a golden cross for the czar. Um, but essentially saying that this this is going to move lower, um, that trend should continue, and the trend and it's it's being picked up all over the place. Um, you can see that on the uh, I've got the Rand Swiss franc as well, clearly in a down channel. Also, um, that uh, kind of golden cross for the Rand, death cross for the franc, and you can see this isn't just dollar weakness or, or developed market weakness. This is Rand strength playing through because you're seeing a very similar pattern against all the major uh, currencies. Um, against the euro, as you can expect, you can see the euro is actually accelerating its downtrend. Um, that uh, makes sense. I mean, let's look at what's happening in Europe at the moment. Um, pretty scary place. Um, and you can see there, you, you've got kind of the, the traditional down channel there. We had a break of that channel, and it's now starting to pick up a, a new, even steeper down channel. So uh, Europe against the Rand uh, really starting to collapse. Um, but yeah, no indication that this is going to turn. So would I be aggressively moving currency out at this stage? Like I said, I'm taking Rand dollar. I think 1440 is the level. I've taken a little bit there, um, but there's no there's no indication that the trend is changing. So if you're just looking at the at the technical picture, um, until until you see a break of that blue line and, and move up, you would probably stay stay in stay in Rand. Stick it in a fixed deposit. I don't know. That's that's kind of. Uh, earn some high interest in, in earn some high interest in South Africa rather than parking it in um, in cash overseas. Okay, so let's just have a look at the equity markets. Oh, um, as usual, I'm going to go over time. Um, okay, so very very positive. As I said, nerves are nerves are settling around the world. People are are, are getting a little bit. Uh, they might be a little bit worried about a recession coming, but they're still very very bullish on equities. So maybe bargain hunters coming in, but you're also seeing it come through to, to, for for some of the big the big heavy the the big kind of tech heavy stocks. And I'm going to talk about tech specifically because we've got a tech pick coming up. Um, but uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, uh, Tesla, you, you know, it's, it's not, the, you, you know, you've got kind of like the, the likes of ExxonMobil down, uh, some of the banks down, which are the typical value plays, and it's kind of almost a move back to growth over the last month. And I think it's just as bargain hunters are, are coming into the market. Uh, if we look at that, I've just given you a global view of this as well, so global heat map. Um, you can see everywhere, this is not, uh, you know, isolated to the U.S., um, I don't know why this picks up uh, <laughs> gold fields. That's what they think we are, just a little mining colony out in South Africa. But um, you know, we've seen big, big moves up in China as well, Alibaba. Now, part of that is uh, there's, uh, you know, there was a huge move. And remember, we, we, 
my big pick for the year is you know that when China wants their markets up, their markets are going to go up. So I kind of said the the FXI ETF, the, the it's a large cap Chinese ETF tracker, might be an interesting one to have a look at. I said. Uh, you know, a lot of clients ask me, are we selling Alibaba? Are we buying Alibaba? It's terrifying to buy more Alibaba, but I'm in Alibaba and I'm not selling. I think, I think uh, we will see a nice tick up. We are deploying, uh, deploying into Alibaba for, for new clients. And we got some very, very positive news out of that. Remember, it's a very small portion of the portfolio. It's something very different. We can't just all buy the same stocks. So, you know, we take a portfolio approach to the way that we invest. Um, uh, you know, we, we saw some regulatory changes coming out of uh, China with, in a positive way. So they are now allowing uh, basically non-Chinese regulators to inspect, um, you know, do on-site visits of companies. And uh, all of this is try in an attempt, uh, which, which the, the, the Chinese uh, government has, uh, has now made clear, uh, to protect the ADRs and, and uh, the ADRs on the New York Stock Exchange. So ADRs are um, American depository receipts. Uh, there's been this big move that, uh, you know, things like Alibaba or JD.com might be banned from trading in, in the U.S. Uh, unless uh, be, the, essentially better reporting. And there's a whole list of uh, things that the U.S. wants China to accept. Uh, China has started to change rules to, to accept that and protect those listings. Uh, that has been an incredibly positive signal for the market. And it's really literally... It's, it's lit a fire under, under the, the Chinese tech, tech stocks. They, they took a hammering in the first month or so of the year, but uh, April has been a very, very good month for, for, for Chinese tech. Every day we come in and it's HS Tech is the index, is up nicely. Um, so there's been a nice re-rating there, still in a long-term downtrend, even with the big moves that we've seen higher. You know, it still hasn't done even a, a fraction of the damage that has been done in, in, in the tech sector. But, uh, you know, for my, my call from the beginning of the year, I've still got about, uh, what, I've got nine months to go. So, uh, eight months to go. So, see, it's getting away from me. Uh, so, it's still got eight months to go. And let's see what happens when, when like I said, when the, the Chinese authorities want their markets to be higher or they feel that their market should be higher, uh, suddenly, you, you know, Chinese markets go higher. That's how it works. So very, very scary destination to invest in. Would absolutely never put the bulk of my capital in China. But uh, I did think it was an opportunity. I thought it was overdone at the beginning of the year. Seems to be getting positive news uh, that side at the moment. A quick look at volatility. Uh, you can see, you know, even with the Russian-Ukraine situation and, and the panic that we saw when we got to the extreme fear in that fear and greed index, that gauge that we show, I showed you at the beginning, um, we were nowhere near the volatility that we saw during the pandemic. And, and that's just to give you a sense of where the VIX went during the pandemic uh, and, and how it, it reacted to, to, the, to the invasion of the Ukraine. Um, now all the way back down, kind of hovering, it's 20, 21 and a half at the moment. Um, you know, still not at that super low level that we saw pre-pandemic. Like, remember, the VIX almost got stuck at, at kind of just a range between 10 and 12. Um, we're still seeing an elevated level of volatility in markets, but it's not excessive. Um, and what and, and you can see there, the, the, the pink line is the S&P 500. So you can see it's exactly what we were talking about last month. And I actually had a, 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 a line in between there saying we were concerned about that break and the S&P 500 does whatever the S&P 500 feels like. Uh, when we spoke last time, it was kind of hovering on that trend line. I said, you, you probably, I, I thought you probably will get a break higher because the S&P 500 is just unstoppable as an index. Um, you actually, we did get the break, but it's, uh, now I, I still get the sense we're not, we, we still know we're near well, we'll say no in there. We, we're a long way off the lows, but we're not quite at, at all time highs yet. The world is still a very scary place, um, but yeah, totally ignoring that kind of change of trend that we've seen. Um, and we'll see what happens now. Like, I mean, up or down from here, that's just about anyone's guess. Uh, but, you know, longer term, S&P 500 and, and markets, I do think will go higher, but I think we might be in for a difficult six to six to 12, maybe 24 months. I think it's gonna be very difficult, but that also for long-term investors presents the best opportunities. So speaking of best opportunities, let's have a look at a new opportunity that we're entering in, in the global equity portfolio. So this uh, last month, we've used uh, the opportunity to buy, we've used the weaker markets to start deploying some of the cash. Um, we bought Adobe. Uh, Adobe is one of the world's largest software companies. Now, 
immediately, if you've been on these presentations, you'll be like, Gary, you said we're going into value, not growth. This is a growth company. And uh, remember, we are kind of, not, we, we're not a value manager and we're not a growth manager either. Um, we have a blended strategy. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a company that is not cheap in terms of its earnings. It does uh, embed a lot of growth that shouldn't do well in a high inflation environment. That said, that said, um, one of the things that we've uh, been discussing in our research meetings is yes, there is a big shift into shift from growth to value. We have a lot of value companies in the portfolio already. Our recent acquisitions like General Motors and and some of some of the other stuff that we've, we've got in the portfolio, we've got Lockheed Martin, we've got Procter and Gamble, we've got um, a lot of a lot of the kind of like we've got a decent size value skew. And I think one of the opportunities that we've been looking at is saying that a lot of these uh, very high quality tech businesses have re-rated aggressively, uh, thanks to this idea that inflation is going to be higher and that uh, you need to move towards uh, towards value positions. Um, but maybe the re-ratings have been large enough that we can start to just dabble in, in some of these positions. Uh, we've taken a 3% uh, weighting in, in Adobe to kind of uh, move into that. It's down 20% for the year when we're buying. So we're buying basically as Adobe entered a bear market. Um, you know, we've already seen moves higher in the likes of Google and Apple and Amazon are kind of going Microsoft as well. So those kind of big established companies that have, you know, like very, very strong balance sheets um, have, have actually recovered well. Adobe has now part of the reason for that, and we'll get to it, is, is, is a miss on guidance, not a miss on earnings, it's a miss on guidance. But you guys should all know Adobe. It's, it's a massive company. It's a $216 billion market cap company. It's not one of the trillion dollar club so it's not a super large company uh into it's not a mega like a like a mega mega cap but it's it's pretty large um you know and uh, basically it, it offers uh, you know a whole range of products for for professional communicators businesses and you know picked up a huge amount of business obviously uh, during the pandemic as one of the big pandemic stocks now pandemic stocks re-rated zoom is another one now zoom doesn't fit into our portfolio for because it just it doesn't match some of our quantitative selection criteria for the global managed portfolio but it's another very interesting company that that we think is worth having a look at the thesis is a lot of a lot of people moved onto these platforms during COVID, and the idea that COVID is now settling down and, and taking a back step, the market seems to be reacting to that by saying, oh, well, these companies aren't worth anything now because we're all going to go back to living like we lived in 2018. We don't believe that. We think that, you know, the idea that we're going to have filing cabinets and physical wet signatures, that's not coming back. I mean, we're not going back to that. Come on. We're going, to, we're going to be living in a very, very digital world. And digital security and document signing and document management is incredibly important. That's what Adobe does. Um, it's also, okay, so let's just look at the segment. So like I said, high P, this is talking about a 45, 45, um, uh, you, you know, P of, uh, that's a trailing 12 month PE of 45, but that does come down quickly because it is a, it is a growing company. Now, if you look at it, uh, earnings growth for, uh, uh, this is for fiscal year, um, uh, one year forward, two year forward, three year forwards, um, you're looking at it growing at about 13% uh, revenue growth per year. Um, that's kind of where the estimates are at the moment. Remember, they've given very conservative guidance now as well. Um, you know, looking at earnings growth, you're looking at uh, next year, you're expecting about 36% earnings growth. Uh, that should moderate down to kind of 18% and the 16%, but kind of like mid, mid teens is, is where you expect the earnings to be growing in this company. Uh, they're buying back shares as well, uh, which should be uh, supportive of the share price. And um, yeah, a very, very good good uh, earnings and revenue profile on the company. I'll show you that in a second. It's a growth company. It's not going to pay you any dividends. And you can see the, the FPE for one year out and two year out comes down quite aggressively because of that earnings growth that, that is being forecast into it. Um, now, there could be a big miss and it might not grow. And then, yes, this is going to be a disaster of a position. There's only 3% of the portfolio. It's not, uh, you, you know, we're not betting the farm on it or anything like that. But I think... I think that the market is underestimating how how much the world has changed, and you know, still how many businesses, legacy businesses that that have not yet fully adopted um, secure digital document storage. And I mean, we have to do it. You know, we're a financial services provider. We've been through it ourselves. 
and and I kind of feel like there's a lot of business out there that that um, that still has that to has that to come in its future. Um, just to look at it, okay, before we look at the revenue and earnings profiles, I'm just going to have a look at the splits quickly. Sorry, we're hitting an hour, so I'll just I'll finish this quick. But um, the majority of this is, is, so they basically split their business into three segments, digital media, digital experience, publishing and advertising. Publishing and advertising is tiny. It's it's 2.5% of the, the revenue in 2021, but it's an exciting and growing business. Now, um, the, what, what they're doing that, they're doing it through uh, Omniture, an Omniture acquisition, and they're starting to focus on big data and data mining and, and advertising and the idea that anyone can create anything and everything is a sales, uh, a selling and a shopping opportunity. Um, but that's kind of like a small part of the business, but it could be where a lot of growth comes from in the future. Um, digital cloud is, is where I think the, the most exciting portion of the business is, which falls under the, the DX, which is digital experience. Um, and that's uh, Adobe Creative Cloud Experience. It, it, it basically only accounts for 24% of the revenue, but you would expect that to become a bigger, bigger share. And then the traditional part of the business, which makes up the majority of the business, which is 72% of revenue, this is on the 2021 earnings. Uh, this is what you would probably recognize. That's Adobe Acrobat. It's how you open all your PDFs. It's how you get your bank statements. It's how, it's how you do everything. Now, it's pretty scary that you get your bank statements on Adobe PDF, and they've, they've got a digital mining uh, ambition <laughs> if you want but hey i want to be a shareholder of that um but uh yeah that's just beside the point obviously there's massive regulation around this one of the big risks around these tech companies but uh, digital media remember think think of the creator adobe creative suite uh, you know adobe flash used programming that years ago um think um uh, photoshop for example adobe product uh, majority of its revenue is made through licensing fees. That's that's all of it. They do have tech support and education, which is another portion of their of where they get the revenue. But the bulk of that revenue, that revenue split, is through licensing fees. It's a software company. Can't expect it not to. That's how software companies make money. Um, Fifty-one percent is in the U.S. Nice developed market tilt. That's exactly what we want. Twenty-six percent in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, small still in in Asia Pacific. So that's only sixteen percent of of the business. Um, and I think that is one of the opportunities for the company. If, like, and it's certainly it's it's been flagged by by many of the the big sell side analysts as one of their. Um, one of the growth areas, uh, they should be growing strongly in, in emerging markets. Um, so they've got a, a large scope to grow in emerging markets. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's one of the growth drivers. Um, obviously, we've talked about uh, Adobe Acrobat and, and, and how that, that licensing works. It is a digital leader in, in, in capturing it. It's, it's, it's got a serious motor on it because everyone uses it and because everyone uses it, everyone needs it. Uh, I bet you Adobe, I, 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 I would be surprised if there's a single person on this call that doesn't have uh, Adobe Acrobat DC at least downloaded the free version on their, on their machine currently. I, I, would, be, I would be shocked. Um, and when you're that prevalent, anyone, please come on chat now and tell me if you do not have Adobe or an Adobe product on your computer, I would, I would, be, I would be blown away. Um, I don't know how you would survive, to be honest. Uh, okay, digital marketing. Uh, okay, we talked about digital marketing and mining. Uh, just, just in terms of the, you know, one of the reasons that as a growth company, I'm not particularly concerned about this one. Um, it's credit risk metrics. So I've just put the bullish, uh, like, well, not just the bullish ones, but I've put the bullish and the bearish. But, you know, we run a lot of quantitative models through the, the terminals in, in our stock selection process. Uh, you can see, you know, absolutely incredible scores on, on their credit risk. They are, they are very, very strong, uh, very fundamentally strong company. Uh, if you look on the left, the left is the earnings, uh, earnings growth profile. The right is the revenue growth profile. That is a good quality company, you know, steady every quarter. Okay, we had a little bit of a, a missed quarter there uh, where we had a, a dip off in, in first quarter of 2021. But otherwise you can see quarter on quarter growth, just moving up, moving up, moving up and forecast to continue as, as that, uh, that is. Um, all analysts, and I'll show you the analyst expectations. Now, now, potential upside on the company, if you're just looking at the median estimate of what, where we think this company is going to go based on uh, like DCFs, et cetera, 21% uh, implied upside from here over the next year. I'm happy with that. That outperforms the S&P 500 by double. Uh, that's the kind of company that we want in our portfolio. Um, and yeah, like I said, val intrinsic valuation and value momentum models are pulling down. One of the reasons value momentum is kind of pulling it down is because uh, also because of the price uh, re-rating. 
very high quality earnings. Um, yeah, good, 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 good business all around uh, from a fundamental point of view. Um, so yeah, this is just it. Okay, so in the most recent earnings, so you might go and Google Adobe now and be like, Gary, what are you doing? Adobe just collapsed. Like, you could, yeah, well, that's why we want to buy it. The share price is much lower. But um, it actually, its top and bottom line in its recent results was in line with the expectations, um, both actually beat, beat, beat most of the bank expectations. Uh, you go, you, you, like there, yeah, I've got it up there just off the, off the Bloomberg. You can see uh, the actual, they came in with 4.26 billion in revenue. Uh, the estimate was for 4.24. Um, yeah, this, these are just consensus numbers. Uh, so not the individual banks that we look at or you know, no smart application of who, who we're following and who we're not following. But um, estimate for adjusted uh, EPS, 3.346, uh, actual was 3.37. So it beat on the top and bottom line. Um, the, the disappointment was in the guidance. So their, their next quarter guidance uh, was behind uh, what everyone was hoping. And it just kind of shocked the market a little bit. Stock dropped 10% on the news. Um, fundamentally still incredibly powerful and, and strong business. Um, reasons to buy it uniquely positioned globally uh, and to expand into EM. I think that's that's very good. I think that the moat, uh, it's a leading, leading enabler of digital experience and, and work from home and, and the idea of core creative market. We, we are constantly discussing, are we going to bring everyone back to the office? Are we going to do a hybrid model? You know, even if we're doing a hybrid model, even if 70% of our staff are sitting in our offices and 70% are at home, we're not going to go back to using paper. It's just not going to happen. So, so it's a very entrenched, and I mean, part of that, part of data security is you have to have, you have to pay for, for data security. It's just the way that it works. You, you cannot just um, go, oh, well, well, we'll just use the free version. It doesn't happen in enterprises. So, and certainly doesn't happen in financial services. So it's, uh, it's obviously important, the licensing fees, we don't see disappearing anytime soon. And part of that, there is a network effect here because everyone has Adobe Acrobat DC reader on their on their PC, we can't suddenly start sending you a different format. Imagine we sent your statements in a different format and said, oh no, you've got to download this thing because we don't want to use Adobe. We can't, there is a network effect there uh, already. Um, so one of the risks around the business, always put the risks and concerns in as well. Um, there are, it, is, it is quite a niche business. So yes, they are expanding into, into kind of a marketing arm through acquisitions that they've been building that kind of acquisition business for a while. The cloud business is, is, is quite formative as well. So there's lots of interesting things happening, but they are very, very focused on their, their primary uh, creative suite and their, and their software, the, the existing software licensing fees. Uh, that concentration could, could be a fairly high risk, but at the same time, do we, want to, do we want to buy companies that are diversified in a diversified share portfolio? No, we are diversifying already. I don't mind going into concentrated companies because it's 3% of the overall portfolio. Like we, we want to have specific things happening. And that's one of the beauties of building a, a personal share portfolio, uh, the beautiful things at least. Uh, creative competition could come uh, could be coming aggressively. Absolutely, you know, the, you know, software is a very, very, tech is a very, very competitive space. And maybe they're not, these guys are not the ones that are going to come out with a big next thing, and that that is a concern for markets at the moment. Um, at the same time, I don't know. You, you know, everyone looks at software as as, as pure tech, and, and it's all about growth. And it's, well, I think they, they, they've got an exciting product, but you know, tech tech you know used to be communication software was what we call tech, but I think the nature of tech is changing. And the tech of the future is not necessarily communications tech, which has been the last 10, 15, 20 years. It's what we all think of as tech. And this will just become an essential product like a razor blade. This might be, Adobe might be the Procter & Gamble of 20 years time. When you look back and you're like, hey, just that stable dividend payer that does this kind of document storage and document warehouse because it will just be an essential function in, 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 a, in a future economy while, while all new tech that we've never even thought of is, is the exciting tech companies of the future. So um, I like the business. I think, uh, you know, the re-rating, I just put something off the, one of the Deutsche Bank notes uh, up there just to give you an idea of some of what, what's happened because everyone's like, oh, like, I mean, you Google it, you're going to see it. It's going to be like, oh, there's been a raft of downgrades from analysts on Adobe. Um, this, this is the kind of uh, downgrade that, that you're looking at at the moment. Um, you know, we adjust our target price from, uh, to $575 a share from 660 Now, Deutsche Bank is one of the top-rated uh, houses covering 
Uh, the stock, they'll obviously maintain their buy because at the moment, okay, well, I'll show you on the next slide. As at the moment, as you can see, we are currently trading at 458. So uh, yes, they've downgraded, but you've still got $100 upside in this at least. Okay, despite all our moving parts, uh, largely unchanged. So, so even with that kind of guidance revenue, uh, the, 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 the changes, so there was a note uh, just post earnings. Um, they, they hardly are changing their guidance based on that. Yes, there was, was uh, like a slight change in the outlook, but it, this, is, this, is a, this is a solid business and 20% down for the year. There's the technical. So if you're looking at the technical picture of Adobe, you can see ding, 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 all, all the, the tings of that, the little tests of that uh, uh, decline horizont, uh, decline um, uh, resistance line uh, that has now broken. The real time to buy was on the kiss goodbye as it broke the, the resistance line, uh, hit the support line. That was the perfect buying opportunity. And we're heading up uh, to see proper re rating up to kind of into the low 500s, which I think is going to be the next move for the stock. I don't know if we're going back to 700 anytime soon. Maybe not. Uh, might take five years, might take 10 years. Maybe we're not going to see all-time highs. But, you know, to get to get our, our kind of 20% upside target uh, on, on the stock, we don't need to hit all-time highs. If we hit all-time highs on this thing, we'll be ex I'll be ecstatic. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, from highs, it's down a lot more than 20% at the moment. So I think, uh, yeah, little, little consolidation phase there. We might track sideways. You might get a nice entry down 10, if, you, if you're a private client, at least a, a private broken client or a self-directed trader, you might get in, uh, you know, a little bit lower than where it is currently. But if it breaks that uh, horizontal uh, resistance line, I think you're going to see a little bit higher. So if you see the break as well, you could trade on the break, uh, the break up as well. Okay, global equity portfolio. Um, now we're a little bit over time, but yeah, so you can see deploying a little bit of cash uh, of our cash balance. We're still sitting on about 10% cash. Like I said, I think we're in for a difficult couple of, I think we're in for a difficult six to 12 months. I think we're going to have plenty of opportunities to deploy that um, aggressively. Uh, as we talked about last time, um, NVIDIA, you know, since inception of the portfolio has been our biggest winner. Alphabet Amazon, that's kind of where our big, our big wins. We trimmed those a couple of years ago. So because they just became so, such a big component, it was kind of making our portfolio lopsided. Last month, NVIDIA was our biggest loser by a long way. And everyone was panicking and saying, why didn't you sell NVIDIA? It's rubbish. But NVIDIA is still a very, very good, uh, NVIDIA is still a very, very good company. Um, today, uh, it is one of the biggest uh, gainers uh, over the last month. So last month, it was the biggest gainer in our portfolio, followed by Pfizer and uh, United Health uh, Group. Uh, the big losers at the moment, the value company. So that's why, like, yes, um, we do believe in having a, you know, we do think value is going to do well over the next little bit uh, with higher inflation. But that's not to say that we're going to change our, the way that we build portfolios. We we, we're following our methodology very, very closely. We definitely don't get shaken out by, um, by short-term kind of moves or, or announcements that Elon Musk is buying Twitter. It's not what, how, we, how we make decisions. We base it on, on deep dive fundamental research um, and, a, and a kind of a macro overlay on where we think uh, things need to be deployed. Uh, but big losers, JP Morgan, General Motors, Walt Disney, you saw in that heat map, kind of the value starts getting hit in March. Um, after the initial buying, I think buying phase. What's going to happen in the next two, three, four months? I think you're going to see that interplay continue. I think that I still think value is an interesting place to be invested, but I don't think it's time to sell all your tech. I think a, a pick like Adobe is probably a nice entry point into, into some beaten down tech. Um, well, how's the markets reacting? Um, yeah, so I thought I'd just put it on for you as well. So we were up to around 2% for the month. Um, a lot of clients are very concerned because they're seeing the stronger currency and they go, ooh, and they're also seeing a very, very buoyant South African market. They go, oh, but just like, have we made a mistake going into offshore markets? Um, no. Uh, so I thought I'll just match you onto. So over the last month, uh, South African, uh, South Africa, even with the much much stronger currency in constant currency terms, uh, you're actually down 1.78%. Um, so still outperforming South Africa, but we are lagging a little. Okay, we beat we beat Europe and the UK where we are global managed portfolio, uh, but US, uh, you know, if you look at the Nasdaq, S and P 500, just unstoppable. Um, uh, was ahead of us and Hong Kong, uh, which is down. So our benchmark is actually the MSCI world. We 
okay, marginally behind. So about a couple of basis points behind. Uh, it went up by 2.4% for the, the month. We were up 2.02. So um, yeah, a little bit behind there, but uh, still it's happening. It's still our performance over the long run, which is what portfolio is all about. Um, certainly not getting shaken up by a little bit of volatility. Uh, you know, we've got a solid, you know, we've kind of been tracking sideways on our performance. We haven't been generating any particular alpha over the last uh, year. Um, well, last six months, uh, which is which is uh, a bit sad, but longer term, we kind of stick with our methodology. Um, we've done very well, very well. If I just go back here, you can see, you know, all the way back to kind of mid 2016 when we started the portfolio. First year we were flat. Um, then we did 20%, negative 3% that year because it's an equity portfolio. You're going to have ups and downs. A uh, strong comeback in 2019, we did 30%. All of these numbers are in dollars and off the cost. Uh, 2020, we did 18.3%. 2021, we did 19.4%. And we're down 8% this year, but so is the market. <laughs> so we are, we are relative managers. And I think this is a nice time to be deploying capital. I really think that uh, that uh, you know, equity markets are where you need to have your, your money if you're going to be longer term. I cannot see in a high inflation environment why you'd want to sit on cash or bonds. Um, property is interesting, but property is a highly concentrated bet. So uh, still, still think equity is the place to be. I think most investment people and investment professionals tell you a longer term Deployment of equity is right. Um, MSCI world, yeah, we've outperformed over time. Monthly performance, uh, like I said, look, a difficult couple of months, but overall, generally, in the big sell-offs, we do we do a lot better. Um, investment philosophy, this portfolio really is just to try and get uh, really high-quality blue chip stocks. You can see the kind of uh, portfolio kind of positions that we buy. We buy things like Adobe, a two hundred billion. Uh, dollar market cap stock. That's kind of the world that we're playing in with this specifically por this specific portfolio. We've got Visa, Nike, and Google, and Nvidia. And it really is, it's designed for our clients and it's, it's designed for, for people that want to, you know, because we're a stockbroking company and we generate, well, we, we deal with all the pre-tax uh, stuff as well. But, you know, if you, if you locked into a Regulation 28 framework, which is pension money in South Africa, you're going to be investing locally anyway. So, um, with that, I mean, we manage the local portfolio, we manage local stock portfolios inside the Reg 28 framework. But if you're going to take after tax money and invest it, you, you probably wouldn't deploy it into the South African market. You probably, you know, your house is here, your business is here, you live here. Um, you probably want to build up a nest egg. That's what this portfolio is designed for. Something that's going to, you know, you're going to tuck away overseas. It's going to grow fast. Um, it's going to... Uh, when I say fast, it's going to grow above bonds and, and cash, definitely, because there's no interest in, well, it's, soon there'll be interest in, in, in the overseas markets, but generally very, very low interest rates overseas. Um, and it's something that you tuck away for five, 10 years if you ever immigrate or you, you, you kind of, if, if things fall apart in South Africa, you have this little go bag, this little nest egg overseas that's growing nicely and totally independent of, um, of the mechanics of your life in South Africa. That's kind of what we were trying to build when we built this, uh, you know, in, in the heart of the Zuma years, um, you know, seven years ago. And it's done exceptionally well. We, we up over 100% in dollars uh, on, on the portfolio over the last five years. And um, yeah, big blue chip equity. That's kind of what we, we're offering you. Uh, all figures are reported after costs. Um, what do we charge? We incentivize, we pretty reasonable, I think. We charge no initiation fee. There's no upfront load. Um, there's no performance fees on, on, on the portfolio either because I don't believe in incentivizing on performance. People go, why? Is that because you don't have any performance? No, we do have performance. Go and have a look at it. The problem is that a portfolio is not just about performance. A portfolio is about risk-adjusted performance. And when you incentivize a portfolio manager on uh, purely on performance, um, you often forget about the risk side of the equation. And the risk side of the equation means that he's incentivized to take higher risk than uh, potentially you, uh, you, you would want. Um, so we don't incentivize on performance at all. Um, we incentivize only on an annual management fee. Now we've kind of done the numbers on this. And we only break even on our client base probably between year three and four after all the initial calls and the setup and the bank and the deployment and all the work that goes into constructing it and the research and all the stuff that we do. We only break three or four is where we're going to break even on a 1% management fee on the average client. Of course, if you're going to come and give me 50 million Rand to, to invest, we're going to give you a discount. Don't worry. But on the typical kind of like, you know, we, we look at, you know, like we look at an entry level of $50,000. 
one percent we're not going to break even for probably eight years on your portfolio after all the initial consultations etc um, so what does the one percent management fee incentivize it incentivizes me to keep you happy for as long as possible because if you leave me before three years i've probably made a loss on our relationship <laughs> so so yeah one percent is incentivizing the right thing which is to keep you happy as a client um like I said, performance, I'm not incentivized to go and buy the most speculative stocks on the, on the planet in the hope that it'll, it'll all work out and I'll, I'll, I'll carve you for a huge performance fee. I'm not interested in that. And also when I've taken a big performance fee, your, your asset base gets a little bit smaller. And when you go through a time like COVID or you get really hammered, um, you know, I took, I took the money in the good times. And yes, I won't take more money off you in the bad times, but you don't have the kind of you know, cushioning that you should have. Uh, if I hadn't taken a performance fee. So we don't believe in performance fees. Initial upfront loads, we don't believe in that unless we're doing proper kind of heavy uh, wealth management work. Or, or There are reasons why we take it, but if you're just coming to invest with me in this portfolio, we don't take an upfront load. It's just your management fee, which is comparable. It's, it's lower than most asset managers in South Africa. It's definitely active asset managers, definitely active asset managers that do presentations on webinars for you. And... Um, and yeah, it's it's comparable to a lot of the a lot of ETFs even. So very very cool. Um, yeah, it is a high risk profile because it is an equity portfolio. And yeah, like I said, I think 14, 14, 45, that's where you should be hooking, hooking some cash out. 14, 70, maybe let's wait and see, but 14, 50, 40, let's say 15, 20, I'll just be sitting on the sidelines waiting for maybe a little bit of a, a better level. At the same time, you've also got to put that in the context of markets are fairly low overseas at the moment. They're not as low as they were. But you know, if you wait for the perfect currency time, sometimes you miss the, the return on the other side as well. So, yep. That's uh, the presentation for today. Thank you very much. Oh, opening account, really simple. Go to our website, give us your FICA documents, send us the money. Simple, simple as that. Um, thank you for listening. And if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Okay, we've got uh, yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, let's just check the chat. I think we've gone over time here. Uh, how different is it to manufacture diesel from gas? I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no, no questions. Oh, here we go. Um, Gary, uh, could you chat about the SA fund you started last year? Are you still overweight commodities? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, Melinda, that's actually a great question. I'd love to do that. And, and it's just... Um, I, I need to put a, I need to actually like put a segment into this presentation on a monthly basis so that we can kind of chat about uh, you know our South African portfolio. Like we really we really created it for for clients that that are sitting in the Reg Twenty Eight space, um, and and yeah I like we we need to I think we need to include it in this because we always focus on the global equity portfolio. So as of next month, you have my word. We will have all the stats on the on the South African portfolio, and I'll take you through the rationale of the South African portfolio. Like I said, we believe that that should be done with, with 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 kind of pension money rather than as a direct investment but i mean everyone is different so that's that's also not always the case um so yeah we're also happy to take direct equity money into that local portfolio but i will i will take you uh, yeah i'll take i'll take you guys through the sa portfolio next month um fully and we'll do like a little mini launch um yeah you know what we hold in there sabania aspen mtn oh it's all my favorite stocks <laughs> so but i'll take you guys through I'll take you guys through next month. How would you rate SA bonds as an investment? Well, I like SA bonds. I think it's, it depends. Okay, so so it depends what you, what you mean by SA bonds. Um, so, and it depends which SA bond as well. So, so like if, if you're talking government bonds, um, corporate bonds, you know, there, there's there's different different types of bonds. But um, but in, in SA, like buying, you, you know, either SA corporate bonds or, or SA government bonds, I, I think our yields are attractive compared to our inflation, you know, certainly better than a lot of other, other bonds. Um, you know, our real yields are, are, are very attractive. And I think that's what, what's attracting foreigners to our bond market. Uh, the problem with a retail investor buying bonds is that it's generally going to spit out income for you. And if you're a South African tax resident, um, you're facing one of the most horrible income tax, uh, income tax um, regimes around. So especially if you're a high, not if you're a low income earner, but if you're a high income earner, it's, uh, it's very, very punitive. So, you know, like, you know what, like that, that return is going to be tacked onto your, your, your income account, and you need to then 
look at where your marginal tax rate is. And, and you know, if you, you're at 45%, that's, that really carves into your return significantly. Whereas you know, a, a properly diversified equity portfolio, uh, you know, we're holding positions or we're attempting to hold positions for three years in, in most of these, or we've got it in a vehicle that, that allows us to, to, to not worry so much about the tax. But if, you, if you're sitting in a diversified equity portfolio, you've got a capital, you've got a, an a capital gains tax exemption for any of your switching, usually depending on the size of the portfolio, you can kind of release that 40,000 a year um, regularly and um and yeah you're going to pay cgt which if you're doing it in your personal name um you can reduce by uh 40 percent <laughs> well at least you can reduce to 40 percent so times by 0.4 so so that obviously you've got that inclusion rate so it's a lot more tax efficient you will approach an 18 percent tax rate on a stock portfolio versus a a 45% tax rate on a bond portfolio. So that's that's why, yes, I do think if, if we're comparing bonds with bonds, so if I'm comparing South African government bonds to, yeah, I don't know, Brazilian government bonds, I think South Africa is is probably quite attractive, or, or, or let's say US treasuries rather than Brazilian government bonds. Like so, so an emerging market versus a developed market, I think our rates are, look great. I mean, why would you lend the US government money for 30 years at, 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 at 30 year treasury rates, that seems seems crazy low. But um, yeah, why would you want to put it at the risk free rate? I don't, I don't think so. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of my view. Again, I think, I think equity, like on a longer term investment, equity will be superior. But um, yeah, there's a place for bond. It depends what you're using. It depends how you're using it. Um, you know, we can, we can create attractive structures using bond components underneath, but because capital is at risk, you know, without taking a tax position on it, uh, most of the time SARS deems it as a, a capital gain. So there's, there's, there's ways that you can use bonds, I suppose, but yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a complex question. But, but in, in, in brief, if I was investing for five years plus, um, I would prefer equities. Like why, why, would I, why would I want to sit in the bond market? I will, I will do better in the equity market over, over a longer time horizon. Um, but yeah, that's, and if, comes down to risk as well. So there's lots of lots of factors to to take into account. But longer term, for, for what I do, equity equities are superior. But SA, nice, nice place as bonds go. Anyway, thank you everyone for the uh, for attending. Um, we'll do it again next month. Um, yeah, Melinda, I'll definitely do the SA the SA portfolio. I've been meaning to I've been meaning to add it, but it just uh, you know this kind of like yeah. It's, it's a bit of work for me to add all the new slides and all of that, but I will definitely do it for you next month. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending. I will see you next month or we'll chat over the phone or on email. Um, see you next month. Bye.